Well, hi, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, and we're so grateful that you've landed here. We intend for this content to be used in conjunction with a local church that you belong to so that you might grow in the Lord. If you're not connected to a church, please connect here to Marco Presbyterian Church. And if you're blessed by this content, consider giving to Marco Church. We love you and we want you to be blessed. We hope that this brings hope to your heart. Good morning, everybody. I want to tell you about Jesus from Romans 15. Romans chapter 15. So if you want to get those Bibles open, there are Bibles under your chairs. Romans 15. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible. I'm only going to read seven to you this morning. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 of Romans chapter 15. As you find that great passage, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. I appreciated uh, every one of the words of that song that Matt just led us in. I hope we're going to do that again soon because I need to really get that memorized. But uh, that's, uh, that what, that's what lays at the base of this passage, the everlasting love of God. Let me read to you. Romans 15, 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, Psalm 69, the reproaches of those who reproached you, Father, fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, you see it there in verse 7. It's all right there. Welcome, verse 7, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. The word welcome is just a very positive word, isn't it? The other day, Beth and I got invited uh, to some friends at their home, and uh, we got to their front door, and they had a nice uh, welcome mat at the front door, and on the right-hand side of the door was a uh, an attractive uh, sign that said, welcome, and even more than that, as we got closer to the front door, they opened the door and they welcomed us in. And the word welcome is, is such a positive word that entire industries are built around producing welcome mats and welcome signs and all kinds of things so that when you go to a restaurant or a motel or a church or your own home, you can have all of these wonderful signs. Well, the truth is, we like to be welcomed, don't we? We like that feeling of being welcomed. And uh, we like to welcome one another. It's just what we do because, you know, when you say welcome to someone, come in, what you are saying is, I accept you. I, I care about you. I I'd like to open a door to a friendship with you, to a relationship with you. It's when you say welcome, come in, it's like, I want you to be part of my life. So Paul says it, and I want to give it to you from three different angles so that verse 7 starts to, to ring in your mind, 
So the English Standard Version goes this way, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. The New International Version does it this way, accept one another as Christ has accepted you, sort of the same thing. But here's a slight twist on it, same truth, but different words from the message. Reach out and welcome one another. Jesus did it. Now, in this day in which you and I are living, especially after the last 12 months, we are living in a day of division, us against them. Friends have become divided, even families have split and divided. Our country's divided, races are divided, even churches have divided during this time. But verse 7 comes, and it's like this big, fresh breath of air to me, and it cuts through all of the noise on social media, and all the yelling, and all the anger, and it's saying to you and me, put the brakes on for a minute, open your arms. Open your hearts and receive others just as Jesus has welcomed us from His cross. Now, our theme for this series of messages that Scott and I are bringing is LLJ, Love Like Jesus. And so, what got me kind of excited about verse 7 is I'm reading that thing and I'm thinking, let's see, love like Jesus. I need to know what that looks like. That's, I'm a practical person. How am I going to love like Jesus? Verse 7 says, Steve, welcome one another, just as Jesus did. So, that's what I want to do. So, what I want to give you this morning is is a bit of a a road map of where I want to take you over the next 30 minutes. First, I want to give you an illustration. Secondly, like last week, I want to tell you a story straight out of the Word of God. And then thirdly, I want to give you three very practical takeaways, so when you get out in your car this afternoon, you're going to have something to really work on. So, illustration comes first. Water runs downhill. That's what water naturally does. It goes to the lowest places it can get to. Have you ever had a leak in your attic? Where does the water run? Down into your house go out to the mountains of western North Carolina, and you've got waterfalls and you've got streams, and they're all running downhill. The other day, as some of you have heard, my beautiful car developed an oil leak, and the oil leaked down into the pan and down onto my garage floor and then ran toward my garage door, and it was headed out to my driveway when I caught it. It kept just moving to the lowest place. My point, just as water runs downhill, so does God's grace, God's unsought for, undeserved, totally free favor runs downhill to the lowest places. God's grace like water doesn't run uphill. It doesn't run uphill to the proud to the self-righteous, to the, the selfish, to the pompous, to those who think they've got it all together, to those who think they're always right, to even those who think, I think I could actually do enough to earn God's favor. God's grace doesn't run uphill. It always runs downhill from the cross to the humble, to the open-handed, to the honest enough to admit it sinner, the open hearted person who's experienced Jesus welcoming them into His heart so that they in turn go out and welcome others. So, you got the illustration. That's easy. Everybody understands. Water, like grace, runs downhill. Next, I want to tell you a story. So, here's what happened this week. You know, probably a little bit like writing hymns, Sermons just don't come in seven and a half minutes. Scott and I labor for days over a sermon, and so I'm reading this passage in Romans 15. I get to verse 7, welcome one another. I thought, I need a story. Where am I going to get a story that's going to help somebody like me and, and like you really get the point? 
So I'm going through my Bible, and I latch on to another seven. So Romans 15, seven, I go to Luke 7, and I find this incredible story. That's a story I want to tell you. In fact, I got so excited, I had to leave my office, come over and talk to Scott to get his counsel to see, you know, am I going the right way? So here's the story. So it gives you something to read this afternoon if you want to. End of Luke 7, Jesus, we find, is reclining at a table. Now, as was the custom then, instead of being like us, seated upright at a table with our feet planted on the ground, they tend to recline. And so Jesus and the others around this table are 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 facing the table, lying sideways, propped up, and I'm pretty sure Jesus was right-handed. He was propped up on His left elbow so that He could feed Himself. Now, this position then, I tell you all of that so that you get an idea of where His feet are. His feet are now extended out above the ground, lying on this particular couch, when all of a sudden, Luke records, in walks a woman of the city. Now, you say, how'd she get in there? Well, most wealthy people owned homes that were large enough that they were actually open to the public, open air, because it was hot. And uh, they didn't have air conditioning units quite like we do. And so, it was not unusual for strangers to walk in to uh, a special meal like this, especially if a dignitary like Jesus was present, they wanted to hear. And so they'd stand in the shadows, and in walks this woman. Jesus is the guest of honor. Now, this woman has apparently heard Jesus, understood what He was saying, and she walks in. Can you picture this in your mind? She walks in, and she stands directly behind Him. He's facing the table. Others are there. And she begins to weep. Now, Martin Luther, the great German reformer, called this heart water. You get that? Heart water. I I think it's a good way to describe tears. It's heart water. And she begins to weep. But it's what happens next that's that's rather overwhelming to me. She's not just experiencing a little run of a tear that messes up the mascara. She's flooding, so much so that Jesus' feet now, as she leans over His feet, they are soaking wet, wet enough that she can wash them. Now, watch what happens next. In that, <coughs> in that culture, it would have been very unusual for a woman in public to reach behind her hair and to let her hair loose. In fact, most women today wouldn't do that in public. It's somewhat suggestive. It's somewhat sensual. But in this case, it's just pure love. His feet are so wet now from her tears, her heart water, that she can take her hair and wash his feet. Next, she starts kissing his feet. That's what it says. And finally, she anoints his feet with an expensive ointment. Now, Luke, the physician, who's recording this scene under the full control of the Holy Spirit, does not identify this woman any more than what we need to know. We don't even know her name. I wish I knew her name. It'd be kind of cool to say her name. But obviously, God doesn't want us to know her name. Just that and I quote directly from Luke, a woman of the city who was a sinner. Now, most of the time, and your mind probably goes there like mine, I guess she was a prostitute. doesn't say that. It does say that her reputation in town was that she was a sinner, and maybe she was a prostitute, but like most of us as sinners, there's layers. And so, Luke very wisely doesn't tell us Because, you see, if you're like me, if I was reading through my Bible and got to the end of Luke, oh, yeah, she was a prostitute, I'm not a prostitute, therefore I'm not going to read the end of Luke 7, and I move to Luke 8. 
and miss the whole point. So the fact that we don't know is good for us because she was a sinner. Everybody around that table was a sinner except one. Everybody in that town was a sinner, and everybody in this room is a sinner, except maybe a couple of you. There might be a few exceptions here this morning. I'm not sure. You see, it matters not if you are a prostitute. It matters not if you are a homosexual, a thief, a dishonest business person, a liar. It matters not if you abuse alcohol or drugs, if you've paid for or had an abortion, or if you're just a garden variety, self-righteous, self-centered, stingy, arrogant Presbyterian. We're all in the same boat with this woman, all of us, every single, some of us don't want to admit it quite yet. Can you picture her? She walks into this room that's crowded with the religious big shots of the day. Jesus is there by invitation. And she quietly goes about her business. I mean, I wish I could have been there. And, and the business of humbly just loving Jesus. An act of thankfulness because clearly He has touched her life and changed her. She's a new woman. She knew she needed a Savior. And now this woman whose name we will only know when we get home, is teaching us at Marco about worship, thankfulness, tears, a sacrifice of praise and honor. Now, what's the backstory of the extravagant action on the part of this woman? Well, nothing less than the extravagant action of Jesus, who does what? He welcomes her. He welcomes this woman. Jesus welcomes anyone and everyone. Romans 15, 7, welcome one another just as Christ, it does not say is, it's has, because it was there that He welcomed us. Think about this. Here's a woman who really believes that Jesus will welcome her so much so that she had the courage to walk into that room, not stay in the shadows, come right up to Jesus, the guest of honor, and cry on His feet, kiss His feet. Clearly, this woman had never been to Marco Presbyterian Church. I mean, we're too proper for that, aren't we? I mean, that's just, that has to happen somewhere else. Though I will let you know we're moving in this direction, which I'm happy about. But don't miss the most obvious point. Her actions tell us much more about Jesus than about this woman. That she could approach Jesus like this means that somehow she already knew and believed that He would receive her. Why else would she do such a thing that He would welcome her? that that she wouldn't come out of the shadows and begin to wash his feet. She believed he wouldn't shoo her off, that he wouldn't push her away, that he wouldn't dismiss her. You see, already I'm learning. Jesus exudes welcome. He exudes welcome. I mean, he's better than any welcome doormat or a welcome sign. Jesus is the full embodiment of welcome. Now, which direction does water run? Downhill, every time. This woman whose sins were public knowledge get forgiven at this party. If you read the story this afternoon, you'll see it. I mean, right here in the middle of this special dinner, we've got weeping, uh, washing, kissing, and anointing And Jesus turns and says, woman, your sins are forgiven. Wow. This this man has welcomed her. Now, every time I read this story, and I don't know how many times I've read it this week, but I keep thinking, I think it's amazing that Jesus didn't say, woman, really, now? Can't you see I'm the guest of honor at this thing? Have you ever been the guest of honor at some special thing and had a woman walk up and weep over you and wash your feet? I mean, this is... 
He doesn't resist her in any way. Instead of pushing her away, he welcomes her. He welcomes her actions and goes on then to use her actions of weeping, washing, and kissing to shame the religious bigwigs for their pompous and their proud and their self righteous. And we know who was around that table with Jesus. They were people who really, really thought that they were good enough to earn God's favor. And because grace does not run uphill, they get none of His grace. And she's getting it all. She gets all of it right there. And Jesus ends up rejecting those religious leaders who had no interest in confessing their sin and coming to Jesus like she did. But the most potent part of the story, and the part that kind of hit me be between the eyes, is then to put myself in this woman's shoes. She's surrounded now in this dining room by the judgmental, by the intolerant, by the holier than thou who had no intention of welcoming this woman. I imagine Simon the host just wishes there was a way to carry her out and get over this embarrassment. But they were sitting there in judgment of her. Jesus could read his mind and called him out. Called him out in public because he was sitting there in his mind pointing the finger at her. She needed compassion and they condemned her. I would imagine all of you have heard that famous quote from Mahatma Gandhi. I actually hate the quote, but I'm going to give it to you. I probably hate it because I'm guilty. Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. True story out of Nashville. There was a couple, husband and wife, who both loved Jesus, followed Jesus very seriously, in fact. And they befriended a gay man in that city and invited him over for dinner one evening. And he took up their invitation, not really knowing them all that well. They had a nice meal together. They then moved from the dining room out into the living room. And as he sat down, their gay friend sat down, he noticed there was a Bible on the coffee table. And over on the bookshelves, there were books that were clearly Christian books. And he's kind of scratching his head inside, and then he says out loud to them, I take it that you are Christians, and yet you treat me like you like me. You see, watch Jesus. He's the most holy one in the universe, absolutely pure and holy. And he welcomes a woman with a bad reputation in town. At this point, Jesus turns on the religious big shots and basically says to them, can you imagine, says to them, you never welcomed me. You could have heard a pin drop in that room at this point. You never welcomed me. You invited me for dinner. You gave me no water for my feet. You didn't give me the customary kiss on the cheek. You gave me no ointment to clean up my feet. You didn't welcome me, and you didn't welcome this woman. I've welcomed her, and I reject you. I remind you that you've rejected grace. Grace does not run uphill. It only runs downhill. Now, I've told you this story. I gave you an illustration. But now we've got to get back to Romans 15, 7 sometime this morning. And I wonder if you can hear it. You got it almost memorized now, don't you? Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as, just as, Christ has completed action, grammatically, as Christ has welcomed you from His cross. Now, here's what happened to me. When that story began to have its impact on my mind and heart, every time I would go back to verse 7, it seemed to get just a little louder, decibels would increase. It started booming in my mind. Welcome one another. Welcome one another. Jesus, welcome this woman. I ask you, can you hear verse 7? 
I mean, to me, it sounds like a 40-foot waterfalls from western North Carolina. It's, it's ear-shattering. So I ask you, are you ready to obey verse 7 with both conviction and enthusiasm? You say, Steve, yeah, I, th- I think so, but how? How am I going to obey verse 7? Well, I'm going to try to give you some practical things to take home because I recognize I'm experiencing it, quite frankly. These are hard days to live. These are hard days to talk to others because everybody's kind of mad at everybody and we're war over opinions and everybody's got strongly held views. But I want to give you some ideas from the text how to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. The first thing that you need to do is look at the cross. You just need to stay right there at the base of the cross and keep looking at it. Verse 3 says it all, for Christ did not please Himself, but as it is written, Paul quotes from Psalm 69, the reproaches of those, he's saying this to his father, the reproaches of those who reproached you, my father, fell not on all those sinners like this woman, they fell on me. Do you see it? In other words, if Jesus had been born there in Bethlehem and chosen to just take care of Himself, do His own thing, uh, please Himself, where would you and I be today? But look at Him. He took every insult that has ever been thrown at God. He took every denial of God. He took every curse word that's ever been spoken down through history against God. God, every rejection of God, every sin against God, and willingly stood in for us. The innocent for the guilty. He took that woman's sins. Her sins were so loud that everybody in town knew. They gossiped about it all the time. He bore her sins because he was more interested in welcoming her than in taking care of himself. He put his her welfare ahead of his own. So to put verse 7 into practice, you and I are going to need to spend some time just looking at the cross. Because you see, that's where, that's where Jesus welcomed this woman. That's where you and I are welcome, no matter who you are this morning. Your pile of sins and my pile of sins, I think mine are lower than yours. Mine are probably higher than yours. Our pile of sins are bigger than this campus, and this is one big campus. Jesus bore them all. He now welcomes us like He welcomed that woman, because grace runs which way? Downhill. And I'm asking you, will you receive His love? Will you receive His welcome? In a sense, do you wish you were that woman? You see, I know as Presbyterians, we got to be careful about talking about feelings, and, and you know I'm not real good about that, uh, but I'm going to try this morning because I think it's in the text. Somehow, Jesus made that woman feel welcome. How else would she have gotten in that room and walked up and done something like that? Somehow, He made her feel as though He would accept her. That, that the truth is that, that, that people were comfortable with Jesus. In fact, if you read the book of Luke this afternoon, you'll find that, that clearly sinners felt at ease with Jesus. What a wonderful thing. Jesus has a way of just pulling people into His heart. Has Jesus pulled you into His heart? Is He pulling you into his heart right now. Just listen to this. I shared this with our cycling group yesterday. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That's just a fact. But watch this. Whoever, that sounds very welcoming, doesn't it? Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I heard somebody just say that. You knew that. It's a beautiful verse, isn't it? So you've got to spend time at the cross. Secondly, you need to listen to the Word. Listen to the Word. You see, 
I'll tell you a little story. One of you came to visit me in my office the other day, and we were just having a friendly conversation. In the course of that conversation, this person shared that every single day, she and her husband are reading straight through God's Word. I'm sitting there thinking, wow, I like this. And, and I know many of you do spend time every day in God's Word. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect some of you don't. And you say, how do you know that, Steve? Well, I know what I'm like when I don't. I feel sorry for the staff that I work with on those days that I get up and have a cursory read of God's Word and go to work and inflict myself on these poor people. You see, you've got to be in the Word every day. What does verse 4 say? Just watch this. In the, in the midst of this instruction about welcoming one another, I am told by Paul in verse 4, for whatever was written in former days, in other words, the Bible, was written for our instruction. There we go. That through it. Now, watch what you get. If you are in the Word of God every day, you will get two things. Endurance, who doesn't need that? And encouragement, who doesn't need that? You get endurance, and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, you end up with hope. Now, I'm not trying to be critical here, but I've said this before. I know a lot of you have all kinds of devotional books. So do I. But once in a while, pick up the devotional books, move them to the left. Move them over here. And just take the straight stuff. Straight Word of God. As I've grown spiritually, I love devotional books. I get some, I get some food from that. But when I'm writing this book, just drinking it, that's when the power really hits me. So, look at the cross, listen to the Word, and thirdly, live to worship Jesus. You see, twice in this passage that I read to you, the seven verses, twice Paul takes us to the very top of the mountain, the very top of the mountain. You see it, for instance, in verse 6, after he says, when you and I are in harmony with one another because we're welcoming one another and we are not pleasing ourselves, but we're working to build one another up, when we're doing that at Marco Press, when we're doing that with other Christians on Marco Island, when we're doing that with other Christians in Naples, Florida, America, and all the way over to the Philippines, we are then one voice. And then verse 7 says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. So what hit me was the way I conduct relationships, the way I either welcome people or prefer to take care of myself, to do my own thing, to mistreat others, to, to disrespect and reject others and disobey verse 2 about building others up. The way I conduct my relationships has a direct bearing on the highest reason you and I got put here on earth, and that's to worship Jesus, to bring Him glory. In other words, that kind of floors me. Treating my relationships in a Christ-like way is bigger than I had really realized. So, to obey verse 7, uh, you may need to do what I had to do the other day. I, um, I was actually working on this sermon, and then I realized I needed to fix a spigot outside the house. Our house is 24 years old, and stuff breaks. And so I took the spigot, cycled up to Ace. They suggested this part, $2 and whatever. Got back home, wrong part, cycled back up to Ace, got the right part, came back, walked into my shop, ready to go. I couldn't find my pliers. The reason I couldn't find my pliers is my workbench was an embarrassing mess. We've been so busy over the last three months in season and everything, I've just accumulated piles of stuff. So I had to spend an entire hour cleaning my workbench before I could find pliers to fix my spigot. I had to throw stuff away, I had to put, stu hang, put, put everything back the way it's supposed to be. So anyway, don't come and look at my um, workbench, though it is a little better. My point is, I'm doing that realizing I can't get a project done unless I clean my workbench. I can't obey verse 7 unless I clean some things up, unless I throw some things out. For example, verse 7 tells us 
to welcome one another. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to defeat one another, gossip about one another, throw one another under the bus, cancel one another, shame one another, exclude one another, judge one another, confess one another's sins, draw conclusions about one another before the evidence is in, rant and rave and yell at one another. Now, I see somebody over here wrote all those down. It's good work. But you see, the Bible doesn't say that, does it? To welcome one another, I got to do some cleanup. And the culture's telling me how to behave. The culture doesn't know what it's even talking about. It's all wrong, especially now. I've got to follow verse 7. And I may need, therefore, and you may need, therefore, to do some serious repenting. Because remember, from the moment you were born, the moment I was born, we were self centered. From the moment we were born, we wanted our needs met like right now. The bad news is that we remain that way in our 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s until Jesus welcomes us and moves in and begins to change us as He changed that beautiful woman. And you know what's going to happen when He starts changing you? Grace runs downhill, doesn't it? And you're going to be full of grace and love. And then we will, as verse 6 says, have one voice, not discordant voices of praising God. And you know what you might find? You might find that you, even the men in this room, have some heart water flowing, some good, genuine tears. And you and I might say, I wish that I could have been that woman. I wish I could have been that woman and cried over Jesus' feet and washed His feet and kissed His feet and anointed His feet. And then I would be more inclined to do similar things for you and you for me. May the Holy Spirit help us put verse 7 to work. Now, before I pray... This is when Frank's going to get busy according to what Scott said, and we're going to take up the offering. And won't this be an unusual thing for us? We haven't done it for over 12 months. But Frank and his uh, crew, uh, by the way, Frank's our newest deacon, so we're happy about Frank. Good work, Frank. So as uh, you are waited on for your offerings, I believe you can do two things at once. You can prepare your offering and put it in the basket as it's distributed. And let me just remind you of how your money is carefully used at this church. (coughs) We want to reach the whole world with the gospel. One way we do that is by building a strong staff of people who can serve you so that together we will be a faithful church for our Savior's mission. A portion of your giving then goes to the dedicated staff that God has assembled here. I just want you to be encouraged that your giving is spreading the gospel. Thank you. Let me pray as the baskets are distributed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've welcomed us at the cross. Please help us welcome one another love one another as you have loved us. And please bless the gifts that we give to the building of your kingdom around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.